welcome everybody to uh, this uh, B2BI meeting. And today uh, we have uh, a speaker, Michael Karcher, who will talk about um, a current and also project, which he will introduce with regarding the North Atlantic. And he will also uh, talk, give us some words and some ideas about a past project which uh, put the function of the entire North Atlantic into the focus. And by this, I give the word to uh, Michael, please. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, I wouldn't completely sign your introduction. Um, okay. So I will talk about the ASOF uh, program. Um, and I will start out with that. Um, that's a long-term uh, program on the Arctic subarctic fluxes. So there's definitely a link to the North Atlantic there. And the second talk will be about a new EU program, which I'm leading, which will start next month called Arctic Passion. And um, yeah, I will give you a flavor of, of that. In both cases, please don't uh, expect uh, results to be shown. It is more to give you an idea what these programs are about. In one case, uh, what they, what is the, let's say, philosophy behind ASOF and what we are doing. And um, uh, then for the uh, Arctic Passion Program, it's what's, what's lying ahead. So I will give it a go with sharing the screen and let me know if there is any, any problem. Um, That's fine. Okay. So you see my first slide? Yes. Okay. See it. Okay. So the ASOF program, the Arctic Subarctic Ocean Flux program, is a long lived forum for scientific exchange and coordinated actions uh, regarding the Northern Ocean dynamics. The main objective or the main um, the main goal of of Arctic uh, of Arctic subarctic ocean fluxes is to measure and model the variability of fluxes between the Arctic Ocean and the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans with a view to implementing a longer term system of critical measurements needed to understand the high latitude oceans steering role in decadal climate variability. ASOF has been existing since two decades and was initiated and, and inspired by the late Bob Dixon uh, and, and his now so obvious, but at that time so necessary and urgent idea to look beyond a, a single spot of a measurement, but look at the, at the big picture um, to get the, the interaction of the different basins the entire system. And of course, this was going back to his own research and understanding of the large connections, large scale connections uh, in the, on the Northern Hemisphere, his work on um, the NAO and his work on the Great Salinity Anomaly and so forth. So following that, Bob initiated in 2000, uh, the ASOF program gathering uh, a large number of teams who are running, observing uh, network elements, um, moorings at the gateways um, between the Arctic and the subarctic oceans to try to get at a common understanding of what's going on. At that time, many of those observing programs were not very, um, they didn't exist very long. And ASOF, in fact, due to Bob's initiative and the carry on activity of a lot of other people has been able to support the application for research programs, which were able to fund a lot of those um, mooring gateways for um, two decades now, and in some cases a little bit longer. This is a very important point because we think this is something to rethink in future and to try to go for a different kind of funding for these monitoring um, services. Because of course, there's the danger that if a, a research proposal fails, which happened in the past, that then in this case, you will have a gap in your time series of these important gateways. So ASOF 
um, I would like you to understand that ASOF is not a funded project. It is a bottom-up forum which is solely living out of the enthusiasm and interest of the people who are meeting each year to discuss and plan and, and um, try to understand what's going on and inform each other on, on their activities. The, eating, the meetings which happen yearly in different places, um, usually at the locations of some of the um, um, key players in ASOF, uh, are pretty small compared to other um, meetings, uh, 30 to 40 people. And um, a lot of the existing um, research programs in the um, Arctic and subarctic have actually originated from these kind of meetings, even though ASOF has never played a prominent role in being named um, because we see ourselves as a facilitator for these, for these activities. What ASOF also is, uh, it, it is a platform for early career scientists to present and discuss with senior scientists over a period of a few days, which, ha which has proven to be a really valuable activity, not only to keep our old minds in, in action and, and um, flexible, but also to offer the young people to the, the contact um, to senior researchers in this in this field and um, to present their 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 own work and discuss with those and also to find new positions. The key group um, or let's say the core group of Arctic uh, of um, ASOF is um, <laughs> sorry if I start mixing up the names of the two uh, projects or programs. Um, the fortunately both start with Arctic, so I can get. Uh, still get around the corner in some cases. So the, 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 the core group of um, ASOF uh, is this international steering group, which consists of um, all the teams which run the long-term gateway moorings in the Arctic and subarctic, plus research teams which focus on the uh, interior basin observations and their analysis, plus numerical model teams from process modeling to, to climate models. Um, this is just to give an indication, the, the International Steering Group, it consists of people from um, all around the, uh, the Arctic and subarctic. Um, a lot of institutes and their activities are involved and um, each of those people are running either um, observational programs or uh, modeling activities. ASOF has five main objectives. Uh, number one, it asks what are the fluxes of mass, heat, liquid, fresh water and ice to and from the Arctic and subarctic ocean. As mentioned, we have all the teams which are running those gateway moorings, which are indicated by the black ellipses and circles around the Arctic and subarctic rim. There are additional long term moorings in the basins, which I don't show here with uh, the teams of which are also part of ASOF, either as permanent participants or they chime in at different meetings. Um, those fluxes are also captured by the models, of course, and one of the big activities of ASOF, I must say in parallel uh, with uh, the US-based uh, famous and AOMIP programs run by um, Andrei Proshotinsky, have contributed a lot to the much better integration of modeling and observational activities in the high north in the last decades. Number two, ASOF asks what are the terms in the budgets of mass, heat, liquid, fresh water and ice for the Arctic subarctic ocean. Uh, ASOF researchers have contributed and worked together to create um, similar budget uh, estimates for different uh, parameters or variables um, and integrative um, variables in the Arctic Ocean and the subarctic. Um, this is an example for the freshwater uh, budget uh, from a publication uh, out of ASOF from uh, Tom Hain and co-workers. Tom Hain, by the way, is the co-chair of this uh, program and um, um, a long-term uh, participant of it. Uh, 
One more example uh, regarding to the budgets. This is a work from Tsubouchi et al. Um, combining all the available um, mooring observations from all the gateways around the Arctic, combining them in cases of gaps, which inevitably uh, are, are existent, uh, with modeling experiments and trying to come up were based on an inverse modeling concept um, with a uh, flux budget across the Arctic Ocean, which is consistent. These are the kind of activities which really are based on the combined experience and, and data sets of all the groups in Arctic, uh, in, in ASOF. Number three, the topic of change. How are the fluxes and budgets changing with time. ASOF is uh, tracking, monitoring the changes which occur, not only at the gateways, but also in the basins with the help of research teams which work there. For example, regarding the freshwater content in the Central Arctic and how it may um, compare and interact with the uh, subpolar North Atlantic. This figure is also from a publication from, from Hain and, and others in 2014. It shows in red the observed freshwater content change um, over a, a period of 20 uh, some years. And the thin lines show um, climate model uh, projections for two um, different scenarios. And the vertical lines show the time periods at which uh, we expect the climate, the anthropogenic climate system, system, uh, signal to emerge from the background. Uh, and as you can see, this time is now, which makes the long-term observations at the gateway moorings and the documentation of the content of the freshwater budget or content in the basins um, very um, timely and, and necessary. Number four, how do those changes in the Arctic fluxes affect the AMOC and the Arctic subarctic ecosystems? This is one of the impact related questions uh, or objectives of ASOF. The figure shows an example for the subpolar North Atlantic liquid freshwater content from um, Testel and Hain, um, which compares observed uh, freshwater content and simulated freshwater content uh, in the North subpolar North Atlantic, and um, is an example for the decadal scale variability, most of which we think uh, is, is part of the AMOC fluctuation and the AMO fluctuation, not necessarily climate change, but, uh, or anthropogenic climate change, but of course we do expect um, to see signs of the um, anthropogenic um, um, initiated or um, anthropogenic climate change based changes in the Arctic basin to flow downstream into the North Atlantic and impact the North Atlantic uh, freshwater budget. Another example, uh, looking at the impacts also the other way around. We also follow the uh, advection of signals from the North Atlantic and the Pacific into the Arctic. This is a work from Mulvaik and co-workers showing the temperature uh, along the pathway of the uh, Norwegian uh, Atlantic current, uh, a branch of the North Atlantic current reaching from the North Atlantic into the Arctic through the Nordic seas from uh, Suine, which is at the southern uh, Norwegian coast, to the Barents Sea opening, um, the, the, the southern tip of um, Svalbard and into Fram Strait. Uh, the magenta line shows the um, observations and the uh, thick uh, black line and also the bars show uh, some model comparison. We can see the long-term changes, the trends, and also the fluctuations. And ASOF is trying to understand uh, what are the causes and what are the consequences, what are the impacts of those, in this case, in the Arctic and the Barents Sea. 
Number five, uh, ASOF is also about innovation. Um, about innovation in uh, the instruments which are used in the Arctic to uh, monitor the changes and the state of the Arctic. Um, on the left, you can see an example for a sea glider developed uh, at uh, the um, lab of Craig Lee in uh, Washington, at the uh, uh, University of Washington. Uh, also, model develop benefits a lot from the activities we are doing in ASOF. Um, the bottom panel shows an example for a high resolution model for the overflow region just south of the Denmark Strait, uh, SIL, a model study which is looking in this case at uh, vertical velocities uh, on a very high resolution and the associated uh, and the eddies uh, with, with which these vertical velocities are associated, which have a large impact on the um, entire energy budget in this region. ASOF also occasionally acts uh, to disseminate the work. Um, uh, this is an example for a book which uh, still Bob Dixon had been editing. Um, we have not been very active in a kind of combined uh, dissemination like a book or, or um, a special issue in the last years, but we are currently discussing um, how we would want to reach out with the um, progress that the understanding has made from our point of view in the last uh, decade and um, get forward with, with that. So from our understanding, ASOF is a kind of unique um, uh, program in the, in the um, understanding the dynamics of the high northern uh, ice ocean atmosphere system with a focus on the oceans. It is unique in terms of geographical coverage and uh, longevity. Um, it also encompasses all, uh, all the nations which are active in this field. Um, it is an open forum uh, with, a, with a clear scientific focus, which makes it uh, really a, a very fruitful um, forum for these um, activities. Um, because people are joining in, in one group for the period of two and a half days uh, each year uh, to discuss things and nobody is running away to other sessions or um, parallel meetings. The next uh, ACE of meetings, um, just for your interest, uh, we plan an online meeting in October Please visit the website if you are interested to um, be part of the um, of the uh, newsletter or the the um, email list to register. Um, we hope that we uh, will be able to meet in person again in Iceland um, at the um, institute in Hafnafjordur in the new premises in May uh, by invitation from. Um, from that institute and um, look forward to meet again after two years of pause. So that's it about ASOF. The, by the way, the, the click and Avi logo on the top appear because we are very fortunate to get some support from click each year to fund the travel costs for early career scientists, a few of them to visit our meeting. And um, Avi is uh, supporting us a little bit with um, administrative support by a secretariat, um, which helps us. So that's it about ASOF, and I'm happy to take any question or comment. Yes, the floor is open for question, please. I, I have a question, Michael. Nice to see Hi, you. Hi, Paul. Hi, how are you? Fine. Uh, um, your focus on um, air, water, ice, um, atmosphere, and the observation of meltwater change that fits your models in the in, in this region. I would an observation. The word water doesn't occur once in the Paris Accord, and the water in its liquid, solid, and 
gas phases is the primary driver of the climate system. So given your observations in, in the North Atlantic, how could you see integrating water into the dialogues about climate in terms of responses or actions that would need to be taken by humankind on a planetary scale? Well, I mean, I, I take it for granted that you have read the, the Paris Agreement uh, more often and much, much more intense than me. Um, so I believe you that uh, water may not appear it is my impression, though, that given the, 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 the funding calls, at least in the European uh, Commission, um, also the, the programs, uh, the national programs uh, we see, uh, and activities uh, like the, the um, ocean decade um, are a sign that, that the water and the oceans are seen as, as a key element um, of this entire system. And are, I would say they are represented. Of course, we always would want them to appear uh, more in, in terms of long-term funding for activities. And, and that may be a critical point. Um, so do we, do we have the right, when it comes to scientific observations, do we have the right kind of funding systems for long-term observations in place or not? So the question is, is more, so research is a component, um, but the translation of that research into actions where decisions are made, either governance decisions or built infrastructure decisions is, is, a, is the question in a sense. So mm -hmm. you've got research observations mm -hmm. look, looking robustly at air, sea, ice interactions in terms of human response to the climate at the level of dialogue that we experience in the media, for example, with regard to the Paris Accord and the subsequent one coming up, um, the word water in the previous accord didn't occur at all. Mm. Carbon dioxide did, and, but water is a larger radiative force or by volume and, and um, spectra response. So there is a missing element in these global dialogues about a primary driver of the climate system. So in a sense, the challenge is to, to anchor the discussion effectively with how the climate system operates, not just the human component of it. Mm. And so it's a question of integration. And so I'm, I'm pushing in this sense to, to ask you to think about how these observations, these research observations fit into the larger dialogue that turns into decision-making on the part of governments. It, the research will benefit mm. as a consequence in terms of support because the policy community will understand the relevance that they have to extract from the research, but somehow the component, the reality of the climate system is missing mm -hmm. in the current dialogues. Okay. Yeah, point taken. I mean, uh, ASOF is coming out of, a, let's say, a corner of just looking at the scientific uh, understanding of the system and not so much reaching out to the policy level. But um, I take this point and, um, of course, this is relevant. How are we communicating our research um, to the governance level? And um, some of that will hopefully, at least when it comes to the Arctic, uh, not the North Atlantic in our case, but when it comes to the Arctic, uh, part of that will be a key activity in our uh, coming program, uh, Arctic Passion. And um, uh, yeah, maybe I can, maybe I can, um, if there are no more questions, I would uh, move uh, on to Arctic Passion, but I, I am, I'm still open uh, for any question, of course. Uh, there is a question of Catherine Niederstadt. Uh, yes, um, thank you. So you mentioned funding. So I had a couple of questions on that. You know, who, who now funds these long-term moorings? Are these already internationally funded? Are there mechanisms that exist? And also kind of a second part is, are there specific hotspots of change 
where there are no moorings that, you know, really there need to be these long-term moorings installed in order to detect changes of fresh water and, you know, changes of state. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Very good questions also. Um, so first of all, all these moorings are not um, funded by coordinated efforts yet. This is one of the things which we hope that will emerge in the, in the future at some point. But so far, these are all either national funding programs, like for example, the Davis Strait program is funded by NSF. Uh, the Bering Strait program from Rebecca Woodgate is funded by NSF. Um, then you have national programs in other, in other regions like the Canadian uh, programs funding the through flow through the Canadian archipelago. You have national and European funding on the European side. Uh, some are internationally funded by um, EU programs uh, or have been funded. But it's always a struggle because, as you know, these research programs typically run three years or so. And um, it can happen, and it has happened in the past. For example, with uh, Craig Lee's um, uh, Davis Strait moorings, that the funding was, uh, the, the application was not granted, um, the funding was not granted for a number of years. So we have gaps in those, in those mooring arrays, um, which are, are difficult to handle. Uh, when it comes to budgets, but also uh, when it comes to detecting uh, signals which may become important uh, in their impact uh, downstream. So, so, you know, it's like switching off uh, the alarm system for one of your doors uh, while the others are on. So we really need uh, to come to an understanding that not only for these for these gateway moorings, but that there needs to be a concept for a consistent and integrated observing system, which by the way is 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 one of the topics of the of the Arctic Passion Program. But I think internationally there needs to be a dialogue on how these kind of long-term uh, monitorings can be put on a different funding scheme or, or mechanism uh, rather than single research proposals. Uh, so that was, did I miss one of your questions or the answer to one of them? I think I, I just um, also asked if there are specific hotspots of change you are noticing. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can clearly say that uh, De Denmark Strait outflow, surface outflow, uh, is a big gap in, in our, in our uh, mooring uh, and, and long-term monitoring sets. We do have um, okay observation of the overflow uh, through Denmark Strait and in, in, in with, with, some, um, with some confidence also the overflows between Iceland and Scotland. Uh, including the, the Faroe uh, Channel, Faroe Bank Channel. But uh, the surface outflow through Denmark Strait, uh, partly due to the difficulties, the technical dif difficulties in this region, uh, has not been documented very well. Um, another another uh, problem uh, may be uh, the fact that while we do have quite good observations of the Barents Sea inflow at the Barents Sea opening by Norway, uh, it is a key question for the entire Arctic climate system what happens with this water uh, on its path downstream uh, through the Barents Sea uh, through the Barents Sea and into the Kara Sea and then into the Central Arctic. But this crosses the Russian, uh, the Russian um, uh, area, and there it is extremely difficult, as most of you know, um, to get data, to get uh, expeditions, um, and, and let alone long-term moorings in these regions. So that is another big, a big gap in understanding the system and, and documenting it. And if I may add uh, something, uh, from, uh, make a comment from my side, uh, inside the B2B, uh, um, uh, let's say, context, it was also a bit inter interesting and important to ask what are the forcing functions for the, uh, the Ar Arctic, subarctic ocean fluxes, which are outside the Arctic. And therefore, where we may have to integrate very much of the North Atlantic 
which uh, is for many reasons uh, not possible. But should that be a goal? Because the temperature increase uh, which of the advected water, which now reaches Norway and Svalbard and further on, is somewhere created uh, not locally. It's created south and outside the region. And that needs, uh, so to say, uh, and that, that is an, an important aspect. But I understand, of course, very well why, why ASAF is what ASAF is and is doing. Yeah, but I fully agree with you. I mean, it's, it's no question that the connection uh, to what happens in the northern North Atlantic is, is a key issue in both ways. Um, you know, and, uh, the North Atlantic on the receiving end from what comes from the Arctic, but also as, a, um, as an input uh, to the Arctic with the North Atlantic mm -hmm. current. And um, not only in terms of um, physics, but also, um, of course, in terms of uh, yeah. all uh, biogeochemistry um, parameters uh, one, one may think of. So that is an important interaction. And I'm, I'm very um, keen on having a good uh, connection to the research which is done in the northern North Atlantic. And I must say we have quite a number of research groups in ASOF which also tackle, for example, yeah. intensely the subpolar Jaya uh, system um, and, and its variability. Um, but of course, I mean, there's, it, it, it goes down further south also. So the, yeah. the subpolar Jaya, of course, then is connected uh, to the uh, current system further south. And then everything is, uh, let's say, under the same sky. So we, we do have the atmospheric forcing, um, which, is, which is, of course, impacting also on the large scale, much beyond one, just one uh, ocean basin, that's for sure. Let me just add one comment before you give you the word to describe uh, passion. Um, uh, there is, for understandable reasons, a lot of research done in the Arctic, and I am one of those many who <laughs> work in the Arctic. But um, the Arctic is a, a place uh, where uh, the signals uh, are very strong and, uh, uh, and therefore very much a, a emphasis is given to the Arctic now. That has not always been the case, but that yeah. may uh, suffer from a, a little wider context to underst understand the Arctic as part of a, of the Northern Hemisphere, for example. Yes. And um, so, and I say that because uh, among those which follow us and are interesting, there is um, many people uh, working in the high north, and much less people uh, working in the deep south, and. Yes. Uh, we need to work or have an understanding on the balance in the entire B2B uh, uh, initiative. Yes. I look at my watch and we are now 10 minutes past uh, five, my time. And I give you the word now to present on your new and ongoing push, uh, uh, project passion, please. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, and I can only uh, I can only support what you just said about um, about the importance of the southern regions, um, which is a different topic for a different time. But it would be interesting to know also um, when it comes to the very far south in terms of the North Atlantic, uh, touching Africa, for example. What is the connections to local researchers yeah. there? Um, how how much has that been um, sought? Um, so far, but that's a that's a different a different topic. But okay. we will uh, one of the speakers for the seminars uh, in the autumn will come from Tenerife and uh, Cap Verde and uh, that part of the ocean. So okay. we will try to put point to that. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I'm I'm just trying to put away your. Okay, good. So Arctic passion. I start with a citation from a paper which uh, Sandy Starkweather, the, the chair of the SEON um, program, uh, the Sustainable Arctic Observing Network program has written as part of uh, the Roadmap for Arctic Observing and Data Systems initiative uh, recently. The lack of consistent and holistic mechanisms to assess observing system priorities and link independently funded efforts across the Arctic can be viewed as a systematic shortcoming that has hindered adaptation strategies and limited funding responses 
for an expanded and improved observing system. In the context of this statement or, or criticism, if you want, or analysis, uh, which has been uh, around for quite some time and in support for SEON as one element, the European Union has uh, launched a call some uh, three years ago for an, uh, uh, a program as part of the Horizon 2020 funding scheme, a four-year program for 15 million euro to support uh, the, the observing system build up in the Arctic Ocean and ask for a lot of different aspects which should be taken into account for this. And we have been lucky enough with our consortium to win this competition and will start um, our project, which we call Arctic Passion and in full name, Pan-Arctic Observing System of Systems, Implementing Observations for Societal Needs to start this in 1st July, uh, we are uh, consisting of 35 partner institutions from 17 countries and eight indigenous communities. Uh, the Alfred Wegener Institute is coordinating this and we have a strong six person uh, lead team, which is mentioned here, which supports the coordination, which I'm doing. But just to, to uh, mention, um, the consortium really incorporates a lot of the important players from our point of view in the Arctic observing uh, arena, let's say, a lot of the northern uh, weather services like uh, FMI, DMI and uh, Met Norway. Um, we do have a lot of the institutions, scientific or state institutions, which are running elements of the Arctic observing system on the terrestrial sphere, in the ocean, and in satellites as partners in the, in the project. For example, we have a, a number of uh, existing observing systems in there, like SIOS from Svalbard, uh, Interact um, on, on land, um, or the um, SAS program um, and so on. So, um, and I just saw that uh, Timo from uh, the University of Lapland from Arctic Center, who is also a partner is also um, listening to this talk. So um, I'm happy to, to see that one of the team is also here. So the objectives of Arctic Passion, given the background I, I just cited in this, in this reference uh, to the paper from Sandy, is to co-create a coherent, integrated pan-Arctic observing system of, of systems, which we frame pan-AOSS, aiming to overcome fragmentation and the lack of integration across essential Arctic observing system components, to build on existing programs in the EU and international work, like the Interros and Kepler programs of the EU and um, Canadian program CADI and the RNA co-ops program uh, um, at the uh, University of Alaska, Fairbanks, um, which are sister projects, if you want, with whom we will cooperate intensely. And also collaborate, of course, with the Arctic Council and its working group, SEON and other international organizations on this issue. It is important for us to understand and address the urgent needs of the people living in the Arctic and uh, the, in, with respect to the relevance also for European and global society. We focus, not focus, but one very important element is a meaningful collaboration with Arctic communities and indigenous peoples and indigenous um, organizations. Uh, and the, um, our, our goal to include uh, indigenous knowledge and local knowledge into a better understanding and monitoring of the Arctic. Um, one of the tasks we, we have been um, asked to do, um, and a number of our activities actually go back to the expected impacts required by the European Union, is um, to better coordinate and enhance Arctic-centered Earth observation capacity and capability. capability. We will discuss the uh, shared Arctic variables uh, definition and uh, contribute to finding those and defining those. 
uh, we will investigate, uh, we will initiate a number of services which will be user driven and I will give a few examples later on. We will work on data interoperability uh, to improve that um, and um, hopefully we'll be able to empower uh, private sector policymakers and civil society with important tools to better observe and understand. Uh, and we will support, as mentioned, um, SEON. So overall, we hope that uh, we can um, make an important uh, contribution to a widespread improved monitoring of the ongoing environmental change, uh, reducing um, uncertainty and inform and guide mitigation and adaptation measures by improved data accessibility. The project, just to give you a quick glance, we are still in, in the building phase of the concrete actions. So I'm unable to show you any uh, fancy, glossy um, photographs of our activities, uh, which will only start soon. But to give you a flavor of the, we set up the project um, to tackle those challenges um, in this really broad program um, I show you this graph. It shows the three pillars into which we separated our work packages, um, uh, which will interact uh, with um, each other and with, with the outside knowledge holders and stakeholders and an advisory board. But these pillars are one, the blue one is pillar A, which uh, encompasses the core observing system elements and services which we deal with in our uh, program. That is in work package one to extend and integrate observations um, by actual new observations, new measurements. Uh, we will um, have a work package dedicated to improving Arctic data systems, one which is dealing with optimizing Arctic observations with um, model support and one which is comprising all these services which we are going to develop. Then we have one pillar which is dealing with the societal and science policy and decision-making support uh, dimension of the program. And I show a few examples from that in a minute. And we will have one pillar which is dealing with the synthesis. Just to give you a, a flavor of, the, um, of those activities which we can locate of course, as you may uh, understand from what I said before, a lot of those activities will be broad and rather on an, on an um, beyond geographical um, uh, arena. But uh, some of those activities we are involved in um, will be locatable. Um, for example, in the marine sphere, we will um, act to improve the um, monitoring of um, activities, uh, monitoring the marine system, especially with a focus on the um, Eurasian basin and the entrance to the Arctic on the Atlantic uh, sector. We will also have atmospheric activities in, uh, in Finland uh, and, and uh, lake surveillance. We have um, a number of indigenous communities which are involved in some of the pilot services which we are building up distributed uh, around the Arctic. So just a few words on each of those work packages. Work package one, which will be led by uh, NPI and the University of Lund uh, is to establish an adaptive comprehensive needs driven uh, observing system uh, to provide required observations for understanding uh, the um, changes and the functioning of the Arctic system. One example of these activities will be um, to use uh, the uh, concept of the Pacific DBO. Um, and we are very happy that Jackie Grebmeyer uh, and her team are part of our, uh, of our uh, project team. Um, to build a, an analog of this uh, in the European Arctic um, that will be uh, covering the um, Arctic Central Basin and the Atlantic sector um, of the Arctic. Um, and we uh, term this, uh, this new concept an environmental observation node. The concept for this uh, will start to be developed 
uh, very soon. And um, we hope that due to the intense interaction with uh, the uh, Pacific Arctic Group, we will come up with a really good concept um, for the overall Arctic um, surveillance. That, of course, has also a strong link to the ASOF program, as you may imagine. Then one example for the work package two, which is uh, dealing with the Arctic data system. So in addition to interoperability activities and archiving activities, one action we are going to perform will be to set up an Arctic window of Copernicus, which will provide an easy access to all the distributed Copernicus data, which are relevant um, for the Arctic. Copernicus is the European Union's service um, for all Earth observation uh, data. Work package three, the modeling uh, support for an observing network design. Uh, one example of this is using quantitative network design to make um, observations cost effective, effective or cost efficient, um, sorry, and find the best places and the best setup for those um, observing campaigns. Um, there will be an interaction also with the, um, Arc uh, the Alaskan uh, um, RNA co-ops program um, where there is an American uh, a US group dealing with these uh, questions as well. Work package four, as I said, encompasses all the pilot services which we are going to set up. Uh, there are eight of them. Um, and just going through them very quickly. So one is dealing with an event database of um, community-based monitoring using oral histories of indigenous and local knowledge. This is a very exciting um, project, uh, something which has not been done so far. Um, we will gather together with uh, those indigenous communities, uh, the, the, the eight ones I mentioned, um, the history of events which they observed um, and memorize in their regions and try to intercompare them with um, uh, more Western style scientific observations. Um, so that's a very exciting new uh, service we are going to build up together with the indigenous communities. Then there will be one uh, pilot service which will deal with um, an improved permafrost uh, monitoring service. One will be another um, web-based platform for uh, getting access to um, distributed Arctic data, in particular for um, research, but also uh, policy uh, support. So there will be digested data in a way, not raw data. One service will deal with an improved integrated fire risk management service for wildfires. Uh, there will be one service dealing with local atmospheric pollutant forecast improvement. One with uh, dealing with improved safety for shipping in polar seas. And one which is dealing with noise pollution in Greenlandic waters and the impact on marine living resources there. That's also a work uh, co-created with um, indigenous communities, local communities in, in Kanak. And then we will have one uh, Finnish-based lake ice service um, for, for climate change and, and safety issues. This is just a list of the um, indigenous communities we are involved with. And um, it may be um, rather something for, for reading uh, and not for this um, presentation to go into detail here, but we are very proud that they are willing to cooperate with us and co-create with us. Work package five will be dealing with assessing the societal benefits and the economic impacts of an Arctic observing system, which is improved. This will be um, heavily focusing on the pilot services, which will be built up. And um, we will use the technique of value tree analysis, which has been used in the past to create a good representation of the benefit, uh, financial and non-financial, societal and economic um, for society and local population um, when an improved observing system is available. Work package six will be focusing on international collaboration and clustering and part of their activities will be 
uh, to identify um, the shared Arctic variables. Um, I, I'm not sure whether you are familiar with this concept. It is a, an, Arctic, um, an, an Arctic version of essential variables concept, which is used globally. But it is clear from the Arctic Observing Summit meetings that uh, there needs to be a specific Arctic version of this, which is taking care of the specific uh, specificities of, of the Arctic climate system, but also the needs of the people living there. And the concept is called shared Arctic variables and Arctic passion will support the um, build up of expert panels and the invitation to uh, local and um, uh, indigenous communities also um, to provide their expertise in these panels um, for building these shared Arctic variables concept. Then we have one work package um, which will focus on the uh, policy and decision making support. This is one where also uh, the Arctic Center, Timo and his, his people are participating. One of the activities, for example, will be two-way dialogues uh, and consultation meetings uh, with relevant policy and decision makers from the local to the regional and international level. And we have work package eight, which is a synthesis work package and um, work package nine will be dealing with outreach and um, dialogue activities with uh, the public. Uh, it will also provide information in major local and indigenous uh, languages. So this is a detailing of the um, Copernicus action, but this is not something which is relevant for, for this um, talk. So I stop here and I'm happy to take questions if you want. So maybe I should stop sharing. Paul, you are talking and we don't hear you. Pardon me? I see to Paul Rossman. He was uh, moving his mouth, but we didn't hear him. Ah. He's muted. I was afraid you couldn't hear me. Well, I heard you all. <laughs> Thank you. It was very interesting to hear what has come out of this. Fantastic. And um, I was pushing for the money for this some three, four years ago when I was in the advisory board in EU. So it's good to see how it is ending up now in a, in a, in a real program. That's congratulations. Yeah, thank you very much, and 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 thanks for pushing this. Um, I think it, it it really is a very um, important and 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 relevant call, and we were very uh, very happy and very lucky um, to make it. And um, our in, intense uh, in intense interaction also with people outside of our consortium because we we take we really want to take an integrative um, approach to this. Um, it is obvious to us that the entire community, even those institutions which have been on competing proposals, need to be, uh, need to be part of the, the activities, even though they are not having paid shares in, in this. Yeah. Oh, it's been a major problem for AMAP, who is a big user of data to get access to data. So yes. that's yeah. why Together with uh, Volker Rachold, back in the Russian leadership of Arctic Council, we were pushing for establishing SEON mm -hmm. to see if that could be a tool to open up yeah. more data from the countries who are sitting and protecting the data. Yeah, yeah, we are very um, glad that that SEON is open for this uh, interaction, and also AMAP is is partner in our in our proposal. So we really hope that we can give a good support to SEON and to AMAP uh, with our activities. There was a question by Jack Depp, please. So oh, I, I have two questions, and I guess uh, one may be an easier answer, but uh, when you were talking about Sayoff, you were mentioning how difficult it was to get data and get access to Russia. And so mm -hmm. do you think that the few Russian partners in passion are going to make that easier to create a true pan-Arctic <laughs> observing system? <laughs> Or are we going to have the same problem, right? Because that's a huge part of the whole system, and we still can't learn about Russia. It seems uh, kind of frustrating. And Sorry, the yes. second, the second yes, question yes. was: uh, <laughs> so this is outstanding idea, but it, and it's a lot. It's very ambitious and very exciting, and looks like a lot of money for four years. But at the end of four years, what happens? Everything just falls apart. 
Well, we hope not. I mean, our goal is to initiate uh, activities which will last, uh, will, have an, will have a heritage. So, um, but maybe I, I answer your first question or uh, rather a comment. Um, I, I'm fully aware about the difficulties regarding uh, Russian data. And um, of course we do hope that the inclusion of the two Russian partners uh, will help somewhat, um, but we are not naive. I mean, we have enough experience in the group uh, for decades how difficult it is um, to get Russian data and, and openness. And the situation has not necessarily improved in the last few years. Um, so that will be, will stay a challenge for all of us, I think. Um, for the other question, um, Yes, uh, again, we, we do strive at initiating or creating activities which are able to last. This is of course not only in our hands. So when it comes, for example, to developing those web-based platforms together with Copernicus services, for example, um, the, the goal is that either one of the institutions which participate in the project or Copernicus itself will be willing to take over these uh, new services. And that's the goal of these Eurogeo services when they are funded by the, by the EU. There are other programs uh, who, who have similar actions. Um, we already have the commitment of a few of our partners to carry on with those services after the project uh, ends, so um, we are rather confident with that part. It will be much more difficult with all the, you know, hand-waving things which, which are not concrete and, and that holds, are we really able to better find ways to better integrate Arctic observing on the long term? And are we really able to initiate activities which are going to last, which um, allow Arctic inhabitants to find a way to articulate their needs also in the future and not only for four years. So initiating channels of information where they can put forward their needs and their interests um, to those organizations which are actually on the long term going to run an Arctic observing system, or at least guided like SEON or on the European side, the European Polar Board maybe, or an AMAP, uh, an, an, an Arctic Council based organization like AMAP, for example, that will be a challenge too. But we, we really want to try to find ways um, to initiate that. And um, yeah, it is, it is a lot on our table, uh, but we are, we are humble in a way that we are aware that we can't do all of this. What is expected, we are expected to contribute to that and to initiate things, but we can't solve it alone and, and not all of it, of course. But we hope that it is a significant contribution which leaves us in a better state after four years than, than we are now. Right. Well, I'm just curious if in the European sector, um, there, there are like mission agencies in the EU or in the individual countries. Because one thing in the US is that the National Science Foundation has had this Arctic Observing Network program for years and years and years. And they fund initiation of critical observing assets with the proviso that the PIs share the data very freely and mm -hmm. quickly. But they're always saying that this is not, they don't want to do this long term, that somebody else has to take it over. Yeah. Right. Like they think Noah has got buckets of money or an ass or, or somebody else. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, but as, as the National as Science Foundation that, does not commit again. to long term observations. Right. They, yeah. It's against yeah. their culture or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, which may be fine. I mean, as long as, as, as a nation is able to determine or, or, or define an organization which, which is able to run those long-term systems, that could be a way, a way out. But um, I mean, we, we have these things for, for, for metrological data. Um, there are these long-term commitments and, and funding schemes. And um, I think for a, a lot of the other um, activities, we need to find ways to do that as well. And um, there is this funders forum uh, in, in which Volker Rachold, one of our uh, partners in, in the program is, is participating. And that, um, that may be 
that's an informal round table discussion among different funding agencies dealing with these questions. How can long-term funding internationally be organized? Um, and yeah, we will try to chime in with our own ideas there and, and be in dialogue with them on this. Um, on the European side, the situation may be slightly better because with this Copernicus system, we do have a European funded long-term uh, um, or a system which is dedicated to long-term observations and providing them uh, to the public. Also uh, with, with the idea to do it for free um, but, but they don't cover everything and um, there's still a lot of gaps and a lot of difficulties and particularly for the Arctic, these data are, are too scattered at the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been now uh, going on for an hour and I think I dedicate another five minutes for questions. And then I have a short announcement and then we close that uh, this very interesting session. So any more questions to Michael Karcher? I have one comment. You have the process going on with the Arctic Science Ministerial's meeting every second year. Mm -hmm. And how can you interfere with that? I just learned that the third meeting didn't discuss at all the hurdles that are blocking accessibility to data and geographical areas. And this is what they decided in Berlin that you should work to open up and better access to data but at the third mm. meeting that was not on the agenda yeah that's pretty, I think that's that pretty tragic a, to be honest yeah. yeah so we have a political work here with the arctic science ministers so, so that can be a part of the process because I, I learned that it was russia and france will take over and arrange the next meeting in two years time lars otto the um one of the questions that is being introduced into discussion is the relationship between the Arctic Science Ministerial and the Arctic Science Agreement. The issue of access is part of the Arctic Science Agreement. And at this point, there hasn't been a formal discussion between about the relationship, whatever the relationship is. Um, and it's important because it's a pregnant discussion. It's an inevitable discussion that hasn't yet happened. Yeah, I mean, th that is, of course, a very important uh, point. And um, I can only say that um, we, we will interact with the plannings of, of the Arctic Science, the next Arctic Science Ministerial, um, of course. I only hope that, um, that um, these kind of issues will be taken up. Um, I, I, I mean, the, the, it, it could end good or bad that Russia is now now having uh, having the leading the leading role May, maybe it it initiates some activity on on their side to open up their their valuable data sources I don't know um, I don't know I what's, what's your view on this so I, I have an announcement along those lines um, Imgimo University in Moscow has created a science diplomacy center and invited me to direct it. I'll be going to Russia next week. Um, and so some of these discussions about the Russian chairmanship will be involved specifically within relation to MGIMO. Okay, yeah, interesting. Keep us updated, please. Yeah, otherwise in my field, for example, in marine biology, there are some uh, strong uh, members of the uh, academicians which um, keep a, uh, uh, have the position uh, that um, their science should not be spread to international partners, which uh, puts the marine ecology side, what I know, into dire straits. Uh, there are, is, is about 10 years of cruises to Siberia, which I know about, with research vessels which have maybe 60, 70, 80 scientists on board, and you hardly see any of the data there. And they just can decide that because um, uh, they say, well, our data and knowledge is national property and we are not sharing it. So um, some, somehow an, an, an initiative from the government or from above must come uh, to open uh, that, let's say, treasure case or whatever you call it. Mm. Anyhow, any more comments and questions before I um, uh, come to an end? Paul, I have a question for you. 
along mm -hmm. those lines, um, I will have convening capacity in Russia. And yeah. if there is a question about access to data, um, it presumably would be an appropriate discussion to have in one of those one of those meetings. So okay. I would welcome your thoughts and those from others as to challenges that are seen in terms of Russia. I I will serve as a bridge to the best of my ability, but there is that an opportunity. Be, that sounds very promising and nice. I will uh, happily do that. I have been, in my case, a bit, a bit reluctant to uh, make such, such connections because the persons who would make that connections come under the political pressure of the leadership. So you're not even ask people to contribute because you know that they will uh, they uh, they will have to uh, take the conse science consequences of opening up. So it's a tricky uh, uh, situation, but I can tell you what I know and what I think the problem is. That would be great. Um, transparency is important. Yeah. One, one strategy you can use that we used in AMAP, that is another country that was difficult to get data out of, that was US. <laughs> it was nearly impossible to get any data related to radioactivity out of US. They were only interested in see what we could get out of Russia on the radioactivity. So it was a one-way traffic. So if you open a discussion with the Russia, we have two problems here, and that is the US and Russia we're working with to open up. Then they may follow you because they like that strategy when, when I had the meeting that day. It's not only you. We have some other ones too we are working with. <laughs> Lars Otto, your experience is, is superb in terms of this arena. I would welcome your guidance. Yeah. Yeah, radioactivity is a more touchy business than plankton in the Arctic Ocean. So, yeah. <laughs> so the plankton data you get out of the US, but uh, not the radioactivity. I understand that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have come now to the end of this um, um, presentation and this uh, E2B um, discussion. And uh, I want to make a, um, an announcement. And the announcement is that there will not be uh, a regular B2B uh, meeting uh, next week because there is an overlap with, um, with uh, the... Um, let me, I have to find that. Uh, there is um, those who are interested in integrated, um, interested in um, the final Arctic Science Ministerial webinar. Then that will take place on Wednesday, also in one week at uh, 13 hours UTC. And because some of us probably will uh, join and listen to that, uh, there will no, be no uh, regular uh, weekly uh, B2B meeting. And um, maybe uh, Jenny can um, send a letter to everybody on the mailing list uh, to uh, draw the attention of the audience that we don't have that meeting and that there is a, a the possibility to look at the Arctic Ministerial webinar. And with that, I thank you all for uh, being here. And uh, for those who uh, have the summer outside their door, like we in Tromsø, it's 22 degrees. Um, welcome to the summer and uh, enjoy life. Same, same. Thanks for being yeah. interested and the good yeah. questions. Bye. Yeah.